What's going on, guys? Another episode of the Almost Made It podcast coming your way. This week, we had the pleasure of sitting down with ex-AFL footballer Damien Kafka. We spoke about him being drafted to the West Coast Eagles, his foot injury that forced him to retire, and how he turned that into a thriving electrical business. All that and more, let's jump straight in. Welcome back to another episode of the Almost Made a Podcast, proudly brought to you by Cultural Club. Another huge guest this week, something a bit different, our first uh, AFL footballer, which is nice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Damien Kavka, number 66 draft pick oh, yeah. in 2014. Yep. Uh, joined West Coast Eagles. Yep. We'll get into the whole story, but now a yep. very successful uh, business owner. Try to be, yeah. Old, I don't know if it's successful, but we'll <laughs> nah, try. I'm sure it is. Before we get in... Uh, Maddie let me in on a bit of a rumour here. I don't know. You can confirm. Yeah. Or the line I'm pretty up sure here. it was true, man. If yeah. my memory serves me right. Is it true that you were going to give up footy altogether for the round ball? You, yeah, You man. were going to come to Morton City, I yeah, remember. Yeah, 100%. Back in like, the day. Look, like, <laughs> um, obviously, you know, European background, um, Croatian and Italian. And um, mum, mum's, a, mum's Italian, dad's Croatian. Um, and, um, yeah, like, I guess I was playing footy and – it's kind of who you hang around at school. A lot of my mates all played soccer, so you know when we play play school at school, I'd I'd be in the soccer side, um, old and play football. Um, and not that I didn't like it; it's just I, I, I love the game, you know. So um, I did. I I went to a few sessions. Even when I was younger, I used to play, but I went to a few sessions. And to be honest, I was probably a bit more naturally gifted at soccer than football. I had to work hard to be good at footy. So. It's in your blood, man. Half yeah, grade, yeah, man. literally. I, I don't know how you got out of playing <laughs> soccer, but there you go. Nah, uh, yeah. So look, each to their each to their own. Like you never know. At the end of the day, footy was good, but um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's. I guess everyone has their own destiny. There so, you go. yeah. Um, sorry, just quickly too. What position did you play? If you're gonna play soccer, well, I would have played cent- central mid. Yeah, like, he's got an engine, man. Kinda Big like, engine. kinda like um, box to box sort of. Yeah, player. box to box. Yeah. 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 In the box, yeah. yeah so, um, look, one thing that I can rest on is we in uh, in year nine or <laughs> <laughs> year nine, it was my last, it was my last year at the school before <laughs> moving, and um, we had a good side, man. Like, we went, I think, to state nationals, like, we had guys that are playing in MPL now, um, then guys that are playing, you know, just division one, um, soccer at the moment, um, and I was like our central midfielder um, and I'll still have it hanging on him today that I won MVP for the whole season. <laughs> so a footy player that's got <laughs> that's got no idea somehow, uh, you know, I, I, I beat players that played for Australia, Victoria, <laughs> this and that. So, you know, every time I see him, I'll just say, boys, remember year nine when, you know, yeah. you thought you thought you were crash out. If I was playing soccer... I'll probably be paying for the soccer ruse now. Yeah, no, not a bad point. I'm so, sure it um, yeah, it's it's um it's funny how it is, but no, nah, soccer soccer was good. Um, it was good my heritage and, but um yeah, football football was was the way I went. How'd you uh, how'd you get into footy? Footy, um, it's actually a, a funny one. I was. I was obviously doing Oz kick like ever since a young age, but I did Oz kick and goal kick, um, which was like the soccer equivalent. And then um, my dad um, didn't want me to play. Uh, like I, I was a bit young, and I was five years. Well, I would have been five years old at the time. And I used to go swimming um, uh, just every every Wednesday. Um, my mum would take me, and we'd then have to wait for my sister to finish her lesson and she would do squad. She's a few years older. And um, I remember he was a, you know, um, who had a big part of, of I guess, my start to my football journey, a guy, um, Andrew Scatamalia. Um, he was coaching down at um, Kilo, uh, which is my home club. And, um, you know, anyway, whilst the kids were, my sister, like my mum, had met Andrew at say flippers where it was and um whilst the two kids because Jordan and Julia were both doing squad together he said to me one day I was only five he's like do you want to go outside and have a kick I got a footy in the car I said yeah yeah, yeah." like as a young kid does anyway we're kicking the ball kicking the ball and then um 
he went inside and I didn't know I was five at the time and I'm like, I want to play football. I want to play football to him like that. And he's like, man, this kid can kick. Like, and he would come inside and he's like to my mum, look, I'm an under-10s coach at Keelaw. Like, I'd love to, like, have him down just to have a kick and this and that. I know he's young, but, you know, it'd be good to have him down. Like, my kids are there, um, Dion and Jordan and that. Um, and... So what happened was when I got home, I went to my dad and I remember he was in the back shed and I'm like, dad, I'm playing footy. I'm playing footy. He's like, no, you're not. You're too young. You're too young. <laughs> and I was a big boy for five. Um, you're a big boy for 20 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a big boy for five. And anyway, one thing led to another. I said, dad, I want to play football. And I remember I think I started crying because he's like, no, you're too young. I said, mate, I want to play football. <laughs> and I was crying, crying, crying. Anyway... A week later, I went to the first training session and then that was the start of my journey. Um, so it was from just having a kick um, casually yeah. um, and then when I started under 10s, obviously I was quite young. Um, I was only six or so, five, six. Um, so I did four years under 10s and, um, you know, I was probably more interested playing with the grass than what I was, you know, <laughs> looking at, at the footy and chasing the footy. So, um I, I didn't play often, but for a number of years, probably till I was about seven or eight, I used to do Oz kick in the morning, which was like eight o'clock, and then go straight to play footy. Like, and then it got to a point where, because I was training and playing footy, I was a bit too advanced for Oz kick, so I'd try to take everyone <laughs> yeah. on because all these kids weren't playing footy. So yeah, yeah. that's how my journey started, and then um, you know, obviously, it led to where it led, and um, yeah, it was just by sheer coincidence of kicking a ball with a, a guy that's a family friend now, Andrew, and we went from there. So were you a one-club player? Yeah? You at Keel your whole I was at Keel all my whole life um, and then up until obviously um, – How does it work in the like, pathway in footy? So yeah. you play for like an EDFL club? Yeah, so, so you play for your local footy club. Then um, when I was coming through, it's yeah. changed a little bit now with the NAB league and that, um, but uh, – when I was coming through, you play for Keel Law. Then you have um, representative uh, squads like EDFL, which was our league. Then we'd play against, say, the Eastern League, um, WRFL. And the key years, uh, under 14s and 15s. And then from there, you start to get involved with your, your call to cannons, your Western Jets and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was a call to cannons boy. And, um, and then basically what happens is um, – some kids, which I was fortunate, I I, I got selected to go to um, Essendon Grammar um, when I was 15. Um, and then you kind of lose that touch with local footy. So Keelaw was, yeah, my home club, but really I didn't play a lot after about 15, 16 yeah. there because it was in between uh, school footy and then quarter cannons. And then obviously when you progress further, um, it's Vic Metro, um, which, you know, is your national championships. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, look, um, Kiel was my home club. Yeah. I love the club and, you know, nine times, well, nine times out of 10, when I go for a run, I'm always running down still at the footy club. Um, and it's a successful club. Like we had a lot yeah. of drafted boys come out of there. Um, obviously, you know, Jaden, Jaden, yeah, Jaden, yes, then. um, yeah. there was, uh, you know, Corey, Corey Ellis, um, uh, Paula Hearn, um, Daniel Venables, James Sicily, like there was yeah. probably in the space of I reckon two or three years. So we had that much of a superior team probably in under 14, 16s that one year level above me, James Sicily um, was playing. So every second year our side would be James Sicily, Jaden Laverde, myself, Corey Ellis, Paul Ahern, um, Nico Kearney, who was at St Kilda. Yeah, so with... essentially six guys. Four AFL players. Six, yeah, <laughs> like six guys out of 18 on the field. Um, other clubs were playing against, say, guys that made it to the next level. Um, and then obviously Dan Venables was a year year below. Um, but like that was the success of the footy club, sure. you know what I mean? Like, And that's probably why – we we would win by I reckon probably a hundred points every week. So um, <laughs> sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, like we had good fun, man. And um, you know, this year I, I decided to pull the boots on for a little bit back at Keelor, and it was actually funny. Like we went through and 
and won a premiership. Um, you know, we probably dominated the year. We was class above, and it was the one year that you know I decided to go go back and just try and kick, have a kick. I only played maybe eight 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 games or so, um, but it was Corey Ellis, uh, myself back together. Um, then there was other guys that we played in those 16s years. And what we did when we were 14, 15, 16, we did at senior level. Yeah, that's special, but man. Yeah, man. To be able to re, like, reunite and, and, it, and do It was that. crazy. Like, yeah. look, I missed the grand final the week leading up to the grand final. I had sepsis. I was um, hospital bound for, for a fair while, um, which I'm gutted about. Um, I played the first final um, and got through. Then when we had the bye, um, yeah, I got hit with sepsis and infection. Um, it was pretty crazy. Um, so I was, you know, at the end of the day, you count your lucky stars, but, um, I was able to get out of hospital to just watch the boys play. Um, cause you know, I wanted to try be a part of it, but, um, they won the flag and it, it brought back memories of, um, when we were 15, 16, yeah. you know, like it's crazy. So, and now like you look at it 27, a lot of people have, you know, got their careers on, you know, happening and, yeah. um, wives kids this that like it's it's crazy man like 10 years 12 years ago you wouldn't have even thought that we would probably be where we are like you wouldn't back then you would have said oh yeah when you're older when yeah, you're older yeah, but yeah, we're yeah, actually yeah. there now so, <laughs> so um yeah it's crazy man it's crazy i, I always uh I always think about this as well you know it'd be nice to go back and Good. Play with the boys yeah. that you grew up and won everything with. Yeah. I try and play with him every yeah. year. I try to get him out of retirement. It's not yeah. possible. <laughs> it's another story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when did it like start to become really serious for you? Was there like a turning point? And then I know you mentioned like representative squads and whatever. How did how did that all come about? So like when it started to become, so when I probably decided that I, like AFL was what I wanted to do. And that was my my sole goal as a kid. It's probably the year I was 13, um, 13 to 14. Um, I went through a bit of a growth spurt. I was a bit of a bigger boy. And I just said, you know what? Um, I, like, I was naturally good. Um, like, I worked hard, but I was a bigger kid. And, you know, I, I, I did well for, like, say, a bigger kid. Like, I was, I was a bit of a chubber. Um, and then I just said, no, nah, I'm just going to work hard. And, um, I guess work ethic and, and that type of stuff was always within me, mm. but I just said, no, nah, AFL is what I want to do. So I'd look at AFL boys and I'd see that they'd run. So I just ran like a machine. Um, and then things just changed. Like my whole life changed. Um, I, I ran to the point where I probably overtrained and, and ran myself into, a, into the ground and, um, worked too hard. Um, but it would have been that 13 to 14, I started getting, I guess my, um, I call them, you know, my key people that I went to, like I was young, went to dietitians, you know, um, at 15, I'd speak with sports psychologists, um, like there was, um, exercise physiologists, surround myself with good people. With the exercise part, I didn't really listen and trust them as much because I thought I knew best because I, all I knew was to work. But then when I started, as I as I grew older and, you know, there was parts where my body was breaking down because I was working too hard, um, things started to fall into place. So um, I started pretty young um, and and Matt probably, like, can see the change from, say, year seven to man, year he eight. Yeah. Told me before. Yeah. I told, I told yeah. him I'm, like, unbelievable. Yeah. I remember I used to be running when we were coming home on yeah. the bus. Literally. <laughs> I was straight out. I didn't be running on the street. Like, I... That was all I wanted to do. Like I didn't see myself doing anything else um, in in life. Like it's either I made footy or nothing. So um, I gave myself every opportunity. Um, if I had my time again, I probably would have listened a little bit more in my younger years. But if I didn't have those, if I didn't do what I did, um, maybe I wouldn't have made it because um, sometimes you have to go through those adversities and, you know, those those overuse injuries or stuff like that to make you actually learn, okay, this is how you do things. Now, to be honest, like I, I'm, I'm not in sport and I'm not doing sport, but I would know my body 
like I know my body back to front. Mm. You know, obviously I got the fused foot um, and stuff like that, but I know my body back to front. I know what's right, what's not, what I can push through, what I can't, um, and ways around it, you know. So uh, it's, yeah, it happened at a pretty young age for me, um, but that's that's just why I wanted to give it my all. So like I could turn around and look at myself and say, well, I gave it my best yeah. crack. So, you know, that's all you can do. It's funny at that age though because, like, you've got nothing else, mm. right? You're so focused on yeah. that one goal. I was very similar to you. Mm. You know, that's all I wanted to do. You yeah. run yourself into the ground. You know, nothing better. You just want to work hard. It's when the other things start to come in that, you know, you start to sort of stray away from that yeah. goal. So I totally understand. And then from there, you got picked up by, was it an EDFL? Colder. Colder? Colder yeah, it was colder. So, so how does it work? That, yeah, yeah, how does that work? Because I've got no oh, So you go through work. the system and obviously colder cannons have their talent pathways. So you start there at about 14, 15. You go through development squads and stuff like that. And 16s, there's a, there's a carnival um, that you do play and, and that's like kind of its first official team. Yeah. Before that, it's more so training and just a couple of odd games here and there, friendlies you'd call them. And then um, 16s, you have a proper carnival um, and it's probably like three games over two weeks. And then that's the first introduction probably to AFL land. Um, they start to just slowly look at, okay, who who could potentially, you know, in the future, what are we looking for? But still, it's not the be all and end yeah. all if you make those squads. Like I know there's heaps of guys that weren't in those 16 squads that got drafted. Um and then 18s, when you're 17, 18, they're the years. Like your bottom age year, which is when you're 16 turning 17 at TSE Cup or now the, the NAB League, um, you can set yourself up really good if you, you know, you're a constant performer and, and you know, you're consistent and you can, I guess, play with the older boys and um, have an impact. And it can really set yourself up for your, your last year of your draft year, which is, you know, you're, you're turning your 18 year because you go into the season. Recruiters will know of you. Um, they know what you can kind of do. And basically, like, if you do pretty well in your bottom age year, all they want to see is just constant growth. growth yeah. um, and and someone that, you know, takes it to the next level in their 18s year. Um, so that's how it kind of happens. Obviously, through that period, there's a number of trials and all that type of jazz that comes with it, um, and it's regional based. So where you live, um, and yeah, like I, I was fortunate. Like where the trial period, I was lucky. Like if you prove yourself at local level and interleague, yeah. you you probably don't have to stress as much. At say a trial at Calder. Right. Um, Whereas some some boys really like you know it was a it was an anxious time like yeah. you can relate to it because you know sometimes like there's parts of your life where you're like you don't know what's going to happen mm. and like that's how it was for some of these kids back then and um, but at the end of the day the old saying like pressure makes you know pressure makes diamonds yeah. so sometimes the pressure was good for some people and and they flourished and then sometimes there was man, there's talented players that are playing local footy now that honestly I thought when we were 16 that they were superstars that now they're probably not even playing footy because maybe it got the better of them. Um, and unfortunately that's part of life, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Like because um, once you go to that next level, um, you know, a lot of people can – you you're entering a business at the end of the day. So yeah. like at the end of the day, footy players get paid good – Good coin. Um, they work hard for it, so it's des they're deserving of it. Um, and there's a lot that comes with it, but you got to be able to, I guess, focus under pressure. Um, and if you can't, um, you won't. You won't really last long. Um, and if we, that's why AFL clubs have all those resources available, um, so they can give players the best opportunity to to make it. Um, because it is a big investment, man. Like, it, it's a massive investment. And it's only growing. Um, you can't say, oh, it's like soccer is, you know, it's yeah, not yeah, as good. Yeah. As, soccer's a world sport. Cool. Mm. Like this, we, you know, we're to 25, 30 million people. Whereas yeah. for a sport that's only to 25, 30 million people, footy's in a really good shape. 
Mm. Um, so, um, you know, it, it is tough, but like everything, like yeah. pressure comes with everything, course, mate, you know. So going into like getting drafted, what, what does that look like? Do you know like, you know, before the draft period, you ha- you don't have like a – do you have a manager at that time or – Yeah, like look, so, uh, managers managers do reach yeah. out to you. Like it is a, probably a big thing because they try to kind of get the yeah, next – Yeah, to, to yeah, get yeah. to you, the next star, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. like at the end of the day, they want to kind of get you, which you can understand yeah. um, because – it works like you, some people have – majority have managers, majority yeah. don't. But um, not that a manager is going to have, have any benefit or give you any more chance to get drafted. Yeah. But what they what they will do is they, they've got the experience through other players they may have that they can give you the resources or, you know, they can help you speak to the right people to get where you want. Um, so everyone goes through that process. Um at some parts of it, yeah, at NAB League and, and TSC Cup, it sometimes becomes annoying. Like yeah. we, we used to have a pigeonhole and it, the, the letters would go to the calder and then they'd go in there and then you'd open them and speak to them like if you were interested or not. Um, and, yeah, sometimes it can be like pretty full on like because at the end of the day they're speaking to the recruiters so they know and they're watching footy. So they're like, oh, okay, this this kid may get picked up. Let's just get him on on the books. For them to sign someone, it's it's nothing major for them. Like you either make it or you don't. Um, but also, as it is, it's a it's a business for them, you know. So um, they're obviously scouting as much as recruiters to try and find the next, yeah, cool. you know, Chris Judd or something yeah. like that. Um, because for them, it's it's good. Um, and also, you want to partner with good people. So is it an advantage? To have one? Um, look, at the end of the day, is it an advantage? Um, it depends on where you're situated. Like if someone is really highly touted, yeah, I, th- it, I think it can be an advantage early on because they can assist with things that pop up prior to draft, like whether it's media and this and that yeah, and yeah. give you that assistance. Um, like it's not going to be the be all and end all if you do have one or not. Um but, like, if you think you're a chance to get picked up and someone approaches you and you connect with them well, it comes down to a relationship at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, like, then, yeah, well, it doesn't hurt. Um, they're, they're managing other players in the league, at the like, in the current climate. So if you have advice, it's only a phone call away, you know. So um, it's another third-party opinion that you can get. So, yeah, like, it, it can be beneficial. Um, like it doesn't have any negatives with it. Yeah. Did you have one? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Um, I I had one, but like then again, like you know, my my manager at the time, like said, we can give you the best opportunity. Like you know, to kind of if you're performing, then yeah, we can get a bit of an insight to it. But at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, you got to perform. Of course, like course. if you're not performing doesn't matter what you have, like you're not going to get picked. So it's all well and good having these people, but you got to perform um, mm. and that's game day, you know. So um, it was just more so having that bouncing block. So, you know, if you go into the next level, Different. you've already got that set up. It's not something you really have to worry about um, because it is overawing so for, for, for kids like you're 17, 18 coming out. A lot of these kids probably don't have jobs and they're going exactly. into a full-time, yeah. like, public um, environment. Um, pressure's on. And social media, yeah, pressure, else. this, that. 100%. Um, and, like, you got to understand with society, like, some people don't have that exposure. Like, for example, say there's a lot of, say, country kids and stuff like yeah. that that are just happy playing footy and they're really talented at footy then they come into say Victoria and it's like Different world. Yeah, smack yeah. bang bang, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like so, um, you know, sometimes it is a bit overawing for some people. Um and also everyone's different. Like mm. people get mistaken that, you know, um AFL players are some like you gotta be this figure, right? But you gotta understand like there's so many players like Everyone, they're just normal people just as well. Human, exactly. Like they're human. Yeah. They're not robots. Yeah. Like, yeah, people can say, 
yeah, I can I can kick a goal twenty meters yeah, out yeah, right in front. Yeah. Or why is he do, doing that on the weekend? Or blah blah blah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they are individuals. Um, yeah, you obviously have to abide by your contract and do the best that you can. That comes a part of the role, mm. but also like they're they're people. Yeah, so um, there's nothing like someone that works just a day to day normal job. They they're no better or worse yeah. than say you know the, the best AFL player going mm. around. So I think some people do lose context of that, and you know. Um, now that I go and watch a bit of footy here and there, it, yeah. you hear these comments and like I just watch it for the enjoyment of the game, you know what I mean? Like, And sometimes I think, geez, like you look back and you're like, yeah, I know you're passionate, but mate, <laughs> you, got oh, no idea. Course. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know you don't know what's yeah. going on in their personal course, life, this and that. Man, like, um, and that's something that, you know, like it will always be a factor, but Going into the league, you got to understand that that's going to be the expectation. Yeah, you know what I mean. So you just got to adjust to it and and kind of do the best that you can do for 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 what you can give. We're sure. we're very much similar like oh. that because obviously we've been footballers as well. Yeah, and it's so easy for people to talk. Yeah, and you know, oh, you see on the headlines, so and so was out yeah. on the weekend. But yeah. yeah, he was out on the weekend because yeah. he's a human. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like you're allowed to go out. Hundred percent. You know, all right, in context, of course. Yeah. But people forget, man. Yeah. Like there is a human behind that player. A hundred percent. You know, and and, and it it is a big thing, and that's why you know, like social media and stuff like that is a fantastic tool, but also you know mm. it can um, be a detriment as well. Yeah, um, and that's the way the world's going. Um, for me, I'm useless at social media, <laughs> um, but uh, you know some people love it, and it's been fantastic. Like a lot of businesses, and a lot of people have had a lot of growth through it, and I think it's fantastic. Um, but also there's a line, there's a line with it. Like just don't push it too far. Like, especially in regards to, you know, like I see whether it's racism and this and that, like with footy, I, I think that's just uh, totally uncalled for. Like, mm. um, if someone, you know, does something wrong that you don't agree with in a footy game, you don't have to take it to that personal level. It's like the keyboard warriors, you think yeah. that that person, when they walk off the field, they don't feel like tiny because maybe they made that stuff up or exactly, this or that. Exactly. Like the last thing you got to do is is cop that. And I, I think that's um that's totally uncalled for and um it comes down to people just being uneducated um and and that's what it is. So, um you know, but then again, like unfortunately that's the way of the world, yeah. Like oh no, you, you get good and yeah. bad. You get good and bad in everything. So, um yeah, it, it's um, as long as people just know that line, that's that's the main thing. So, getting back to your career, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, when did you think you had? I guess was was there like a little inkling that you might have got drafted? Like, how did you? When did that door sort of start to open? Yeah. So, as I said, I probably was a bit of an over trainer, um, and you know, I kind of just rolled through, and you know, I was playing good footy, but. Like I, I had to just stay consistent out on the park and it was probably on my detriment um, because I was just, you know, I was one stage, you know, I was going to see someone to get super quick um, off the mark for my football and then all of a sudden he was trying to turn me into a, a national 400-metre runner because I was running with national Olympic runners and I was keeping up with them. So, like, always got kind of, you know, Sidetracked, Side-track, yeah. and I remember uh, there's a guy by the name of Ian Kite who was the Calder regional manager, and it got to a point where like I was just doing too much, and going into my 18s year, he basically called me up, and I'll, I'll never forget it. He he said, "Here's a piece of paper, athlete out of ten, footballer out of ten. I want you to rate yourself out of ten. So I did. I don't know. I think it was like athlete. I did whatever eight. Um, and then footballer did like seven and he turned around. He's like, here, here's mine. He did athlete 10, footballer five. And I looked at it and I'm like, what are you talking about, mate? Like, (laughs) and he's like, mate, you're, you're killing yourself. He's like, you have the talent and you have everything and all the tools to make it. He's like, you just need a harness. He's like, I don't want you to be an athlete. 
a, an athlete, he's like, yeah, that's one of your your, your strengths. Mm. He's like, but it's it's actually affecting your football because you're running tired. You're you're doing too much. You're coming into games fatigued. Like, yeah, you're getting the footy and you're doing like you're playing good footy, but you're doing too much. Like you're going to be ten times more sharper, mm. and that football will increase to seven, eight, nine if you just back off and listen to us. And he put the hard word on me. He's like, if you don't back off and you don't listen to us, right, we're not selecting you for the, your 18s here. Jeez. And that was like a shock to me because I'm like, mate, what the hell? He's like, I'm not because he's like, if you're not listening, he's like, what are you going to do at the next level? Mm. You're not going to yeah. listen. He's like, so he's like, that's a part of what they look for. So, mate, did I listen after that? <laughs> oh, cool. And then I, I, I went under the guidance of a guy, Steve, um, that, you know, I, I, I um, you know, I trust one of the few people that I trust with giving me a program and he gave me a day-to-day -day program. Like when it said rest, it was rest. I still did something, I'll, be, I'll admit, but <laughs> it was like craft or like yeah. footy work. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't like go for a 10K run. Yeah, yeah. And then I saw my football go to another level. I'm like, geez, why don't I do this earlier? And then I probably had an inkling like towards, you know, halfway through that year that, okay, like, yeah, I'm a fair chance to, you know, you speak to footy clubs and this and that and then, you know, you get a combine invite. You go to the national combine so you have obviously that's – you know, 70-odd players in Australia that go to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I probably ha I had a, a fair idea. Um, it was just a matter of where. Yeah, yeah. So um, you don't know, have really any idea where you're going, do you? Not really. You kind of do, like your manager can give you a bit of an inkling, like who asks a lot of questions, mm -hmm. and that generally means that they're pretty interested. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Yeah, what ultimately like ended my career, like because it fractured and that disease grew, um, was kind of that um, lesion that I had in my foot, like because everyone was a bit worried because it was a game I missed or whatever because I had a little bit of arthritis in my foot, um, you know. And it's amazing that's say what the cause of it was, but like it some like things like that can scare people off along yeah, the right, journey. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, like I kind of knew where and I remember on draft morning I spoke to um, my manager and um, he's like, yeah, you'll be right, mate. Like, and it was settling but it wasn't because he's like, I don't know where. He's like, but yeah. he's like, you'll be right. He's like, don't stress. Um, and I went to the aquarium that day, I remember. Just <laughs> I've never been to the aquarium <laughs> since. <laughs> Man, and um, – and then, yeah, like obviously went through my day and then my life changed. Um, and then a couple of days later I was heading over heading over to Perth and a different time zone away and, yeah, it was, it was crazy. But obviously, you know, it was short-lived because um, of, you know, un things that, you know, were out of your control and I'm just lucky to be doing what I do now because it could have been a lot worse. Definitely, so. definitely. Um also, I wanted to ask because I'm completely oblivious to yeah. footy. Yeah, like, yeah. I've got mates with, yeah. you know, like Nick, Nick O'Curdy yeah, went to school yeah. with him. You know, you get a little bit of insight, but obviously speaking to you, it's another level. Yeah. How does, so you said, you mentioned the combine yeah. real quick. How does that work? So, the combine, when I was doing it, geez, it was a while ago, I actually didn't do the combine because I just got told to rest okay. for it. We did a combine early in the year for, AFL Victoria, and I think I, uh, I I busted the record for it. I think it was like sixteen fifteen I ran or whatever it was beep test. Um, so like clubs knew that fitness wasn't the thing they had to look at. They right. didn't care. Like to be honest, the combine for me was just catching up and speaking to um, clubs. Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of just went there and just sat um, and watched. Um, but you go through a series of tests, kick tests, marking tests. Um, yeah, back then it was a 3K time trial. Now I think it's a 2K. Um, I, th I don't know if they do a beep test still or whether they've changed that, but it was a beep test at my time. Mm -hmm. Do like vertical leap, all that type all the, of stuff. Yeah. And you know what? Like 
some players are athletically gifted and, you know, you don't make footy, you don't make it from just doing well at the combine. Like mm -hmm. um, there's some players that are really good footballers and they don't test as well, but they're just good yeah. footballers. They just want to see that you're in reasonable nick. Then there's a, there's a, a like a small percentage that are really athletically gifted and maybe that confirms to a club doc, yeah, okay, maybe he's worth getting late because we could develop him. Um, I don't know. I'm not on that side of recruiters, but that's the way I gauge it from just looking from the outlook. Um, and you just go there for, I think it was like a period of four days. Right. Um, you stay in the city or whatever it is and um, – and you just roll in and it was at um, Marvel. Oh, yeah. It was at Marvel and, um, yeah, it's like just a combine, just doing all testing. You talk, you get to talk like recruiters, clubs, coaches. They're just kind of rolling around. They'll watch a little bit. You get to speak to them. Um, you get to know, you get a bit of a feel for it, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, But, yeah, like um, it is looking back at it, it's pretty surreal like. Um, it's imagine, pretty cool, yeah. like, um, everyone around Australia, like, kind of, well, not everyone, but the ones that are invited come together and you see, like, you see your Victorian boys, you see your South Australian boys, your WA guys, and then some guys will know each other, so you intertwine, mm -hmm. you have a good laugh, um, and um, I guess you are all going through the same journey, so... You help each other, but also it's a competition course, like yeah. shit. Like we play the same position. Yeah. Like he tested really good in that and like i got to make sure that i got to do this, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of that will happen. Um, but as I go, go back to it, you just run your own race yeah. and see what happens. Just a quick break in between our episode. If you're wondering where you can buy all this unbelievable merch from, where can you get it from, Matty? So you can get it from our website at culturalclub.com.au. Use the code AMI15 to get yourself 15% off. Now let's get straight back into the episode. Draft day, you're saying you're at yeah. the aquarium. Yeah. What Are you just sort of waiting around the phone or do you go? So, like, how does nah, it work? so like some, some people, I think 10 or so at that time, you know, probably 10 to 12 get invited to, to the draft. Mm -hmm. Um, for that top 10 and then um, you kind of just watch the draft, man. Right, Like okay. you watch it. And, and you've got no idea what's going to happen. Nah, like Jeez, be shit and then, <laughs> um, yeah, like all of a sudden, you know, you see your name called out, you're, you follow, you're, you're known as a digit first, yeah. which you don't even, like I don't even know it. <laughs> and, um, and then they say your name and that's it. Then all of a sudden, Two seconds later, your phone's going berserk from, say, players messaging yeah. you, calling you, um, family, like, you know, coming um, and stuff like that. Um, I wanted to keep it pretty, like, chill because at the end of the day, I just wanted to be with me, my parents and, and family, like immediate family. Um, and then whatever happened, if it did, yeah, okay, whatever, mm. come. Um, but... I think they were already waiting in my street because it only took me like literally <laughs> <laughs> like I was hugging my mum and dad and then all of a sudden um, <laughs> like 20 people rocked through the door <laughs> and I'm like, mate, you live in Coburg, you live in Brunswick yeah, and you live there. Like how did you get here up? within <laughs> three seconds? So I think they were kind of waiting. Jeez, it would have been a letdown if like say I didn't get picked up. <laughs> Turn around, <go. laughs> but um. Yeah, like what was um, the feeling like, man? It was it was a relief, man. Like um, the yeah. feeling was joyful, but it was a relief for like how how hard you of course, you busted yeah. um, all over those years and stuff, and also for my parents, like uh, like mom, my mum, like she's known as as the cook, man. Like at called her, she would cook <laughs> for for sixty guys every Thursday, you know, like and everyone would love like. She'd just cook for everyone, you know, like, um, and she'd take me to obviously every session, like everything, like, and my parents, like, they obviously outlaid a lot, like, for what I wanted to do, like, yeah. s s you know, not a lot of people see sports psychs, but I did because for me it kept me in check 
and it was someone that I could trust. I don't mm. like talking to just random people or or my parents. I'll, I wanted to speak to someone that I could speak on that level. Yeah. And um, dietitians and this and that and everything to get better, the amount of footy boots, the amount of runners, like, <laughs> man, it was, like, absurd, you know? Like, they would be there at beck and call. So for me, it was just relief. Like, it was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um, And then obviously, you know, it's one thing making it, then you got to go to the of next course. level. Exactly. Something else. And, um, yeah, that that's what it was. It wasn't like... For me, it wasn't an ego thing or this or that. I didn't care. I didn't care about any of that stuff. Um, f for me, it was like, all right, now I need to start training harder. Now the business yeah. starts. Like, yeah. unfortunately, you know, due to circumstances, um, you know, I had to give it up. Um, but whilst I was intertwined, like, I think everyone that knew me in that inner sanctum said, geez, man, this, this bloke doesn't give up. Like, he's... Like twenty four seven, like yeah. everything was football. Obsessed. Um, yeah. It was football, like, and those attitudes have obviously followed me with with me, like you know, coming into personal life and, and business. Some some of them are, are demons, mate. Where you're like, <laughs> why are you like that? Like you're not playing, you're not playing sport. But yeah, yeah. you know what? That's just how I'm bred. Like when you've been doing it since you were 13, 14, like it's hard to kind of shake a habit. So. Um, I guess they're good habits, but sometimes they can get the better of you, you know. So how did you uh, settle in Perth? Yeah, it was really was good. Like, um, I, I loved it. Like, Perth was amazing. Um, obviously, I was injured um, pretty quick going into my career. Um, so it was tough because Perth is, like, nice beaches, outdoorsy, advent yeah. like, you know, if you just want to, you know, be in the hustle and bustle and, sit around home and this and that, like you won't like Perth. You want, like you got to enjoy going the outdoors out. and yeah, going yeah. out. Yeah. Um, it was good to bring up a family there um, and the people there were amazing, like uh, amazing, like so kicked back, yeah. chilled. Like when I look back at it, I say, geez, Perth is actually awesome. Um, and um, at the time, sometimes you're a little bit bored coming from Victoria, mm. um, but you end up finding your rhythm. Um, so, you know, a lot of boys, you know, guys that now, you know, who I got picked up with, uh, Lee and Duggo, Liam Duggan, he's a skipper there now, you know, so that's home probably for him. Um, and it's amazing. Like a lot of people that do move over to Perth end up staying because it becomes their home and they're used to that. And then when you come back to Vic, kind of like, oh, you don't really like that hustle and bustle, yeah. the traffic and this yeah. and that, you know, yeah. um, so, yeah, no, it was really good. It was really good. And so, then, you know. I just wanted to ask quickly. So you got drafted to West Coast, started training, and then with your injury, how did, was it an incident? Like can you point, can you pinpoint the moment yeah. it sort of happened or was it a gradual oh, so you thing? felt something? Yeah, so um, it's, I had obviously a bit of this lesion or whatever in my foot and that's what ultimately people were a little bit scared of at draft time and then. Um, it wasn't going to affect me till later on down the track. Um, like it just would have become real bad arthritis, but it is what it is. Um, and we were doing like, I don't know, a match simulation type thing and um, I went to kick the ball and as I went to kick, I like kind of di um, got dived on to tackle and um, my, I was in the kicking position, my back foot. So basically my foot kind of snapped in three spots and I had a, I had a fracture, but this little hole that was, say, in my navicular um, was always there. They knew that, but it was a lesion. It, we, we didn't even look at it. Um, it was the fracture more so that we looked at. So I went through all the process and this and that for the fracture. The fracture had healed. The hole was still there in the navicular, but we thought nothing of it. Then cut a long story short, as I started weight-bearing, that hole – I started to get a more sore foot than rather rather than better. Yeah. We got it scanned and the hole become bigger. So what essentially that fracture did was it just broke that cartilage that was that um, protection barrier and exposed that lesion to fluid and that and the the, the disease or whatever it, it didn't like fluid, so it would break down the bone and it was a real weak spot. So in the middle of my navicular, it was. Um, 
the fluid was eroding the bone. Um, uh, and because of where it is, it's normally seen in knees for, for what it is, but it's very, very, very rare in your feet and your navicular is your biggest bone in your foot and it lacks the big, the most blood. Like, and you need blood flow for, for, yeah, for, yeah, for, yeah. for growth, you know. So ultimately that was a problem and we went to heaps of surgeons and saw a lot of specialists and they're like, geez, this is very rare, like don't know what we can do here. So we tried a lot of experiments in surgeries and stuff like that. They were pretty intrusive and ultimately come to a point where like, you know, I don't know, it would have been five or six surgeries later, they said, you know, if this doesn't work, like we can't do another surgery because like they're drilling into bone, they were doing stuff to try and promote blood flow. They could never grow back cartilage. So that was the th the lacking factor. So fluid was just getting in there and it looked all well and good until I started weight bearing. And then once I started weight bearing, where they drilled to promote blood flow for it to calcify, it was just washing that out as well. So it was basically eating my, my navicular way, but on the inside, so I was becoming hollow. And then they said, no, nah, we, like, we need to fully fuse, you know, your foot um, because there comes a duty of care where, like, we don't want you in a wheelchair because um, once that navicular kind of con concaves and collapses, um, you know, there's major problems. Like, that's holding your foot together. So, yeah, that's, that ultimately was, like, a very long story cut short um, for for what happened. Um, there was a number of surgeries and, you know, there was a number of specialists seen and stuff like that. It just was one of those things where, you know, if only, you know, medicine could grow cartilage, you know, yeah. we tried stem cell treatment, we tried, like, PRP, we tried, you know, we did surgeries where, you know, they'd do, like, they'd, like, spin your blood yeah, for, like, yeah, four yeah, weeks yeah, and yeah. then they'd go and coat it. They'd coat it with stem cells and all that to try and promote it. But where they had to do that, to snap open the foot to get access to it. So there were so many ligaments, Jeez. tendons, uh, ligaments, nerves, this and that, that to get access, like, it sees like that. that And the, the top and bottom and side of the foot was all fine. It was the inside. Mm -hmm. So they had to snap it open to get access to it. So the last thing to do was obviously to pro stop um, – fluid getting in was to fuse the foot so the, the joint kind of got bone growing over. So, yeah, 10 bolts, 10 screws Jeez. or whatever it is in there and they packed it with bone so fluid can never get in there. So then your naviculars and all that safe. Um, so, yeah, it's something to obviously deal with but, man, from where, from where I was to where I am now, like I smashed my rehab. Like I knew – I always felt like I was coming back but I knew – like medically, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wasn't allowed, and I and I like they wouldn't like I. I had to retire. So that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Like, what was that like? Like, with your mind telling you, like, no, I'm I'm going to be back. Yeah. yeah. But then you got them like, nah, man. Medically, we're not going to be able to pass through this. Like, I can't imagine that position of like your mind's telling you one thing, yeah. but then realistically, you're probably not going to yeah. be there. Did you know, bef like before your yeah. rehab, did they say to you, that's it? Or, yeah, or before the last you? surgery. So oh, every wow. surgery we did, we, they said it's an experiment. So every Jeez. scan I went to, it was like, okay, how's it going to look? And then everything was all well and good until about eight weeks when we'd start partial weight bearing. Then straight away, I would know. Like we, I had stairs, so I would sl like crutch down or whatever. Jeez. And I'd know, I'd say to my, I'd say to my well, now my wife, um, Joanna, I'd say, no, nah, it's no good. Like this one's failed. And it'd only take a week or two weeks for me just to partially weight bear because I'd feel that. Yeah. I'd feel that um, pain. And I'm just like, man, what the hell? Like um, it was frustrating. And I could go into the scan knowing what it would be. Yeah. So that happened, you know, five, six surgeries. Then the last one it was like this is the – we always knew that that was going to be the last ultimatum. Mm -hmm. And like if it was Joe Blow and not wanting to pursue their career – they would have probably just done the fusion no, straight away, away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and maybe it wouldn't have been as full on as fused as what it was. Um, but I wanted to keep playing, um, and like 
in the end of it, it literally come to a point where it was like, okay, your health comes first. Like I, I, for, for 12 to 18 months, I was crutch. Like my, my leg was like a stick yeah. because yeah. I was in a boot and crutches. Like come to a point where it's like, okay, where's the quality of life? Yeah, like definitely. I couldn't do nothing, mate. Like I, to, I couldn't even like realistically I wasn't able to drive. I wasn't able to do this or that. Like it was 12, 18 months and I'm just like, it's quality of life. Like I just want to be able to walk um, without like pain. And, you know, when they're saying you won't walk without a limp again and this yeah. and that and blah, blah, blah. It was kind of like, man, just get me back to walking. Like, um, and um, I just smashed my rehab so hard and like, you know, doing everything I could like to try and fire everything up um, to a point where, you know, I've made a, an, an, a ridiculous recovery, but I'm still aware of it every time. Like it still flares up. Like at the end of the day, it's it's a fully fused foot. Um, you know, there's its challenges with it, but – also, it's mental, yeah, mental aptitude. Like if I, th if what the surgeon said would have been the case, like, yeah, sometimes I have a bit of a limp because it's a bit sore, yeah. but mate, like I still train with some AFL boys and like I'd say I'm still fitter than them, you know what I mean? Like yeah. anything in a straight line is okay um, within reason. Yeah, there's some days, days where I'm a bit sore than others, but um, it's just more the powerful motions and movements and stuff like that, but you, I guess you just find a way to adapt to it. And yeah, my, my yeah. saying is, is, mate, when I'm older, I'll deal with the issues. Then, like, for now I'm young, yeah, like, I want to stay fit and active. I've got three little kids. I want to take my son out, take him for a, a kick, a run around, you know, when the girls can start walking, take them out, do what they want to do, you know. I don't want to be crippled. Like, no, I'll... Sure. Hopefully, you know, <laughs> I'll deal with that when I'm 40, 50, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's crazy how it went, but that's just – that's that's a very st long story cut short of how it was. Unbelievable, man. So what would – like for me, it's just unbelievable. Like, where you're at now, man, it's mm. a testament to you. Like from what mm. you went through to now, you know, you're running a successful business with a family. But what would you say – did you like – did you learn something within yourself through that period or was there times where you were just like, Man, just in the middle of no, mm. no man's land. You know what I mean? You didn't really know. Where, yeah. where am I going here? I'm not going to be able to play footy again. Did you ever doubt yourself, mm. you know, in these uh, times? Yeah. At the start, I'll be honest, there was six six to ten months where I went off the – not not off the rails, but I – as a kid, I, I like I didn't have an 18th because cool. my 18th was worrying about playing Vic Metro. Like I didn't, I didn't drink – yeah. The the first I there was the same guy Ian Kite. My first drink I had was when we we lost the TAC Cup Grand Final, and he made an agreement at the start of the year that if we make it, you're drinking. <laughs> so that was my first drink, man. Like, um, so I knew nothing better. Everything was football. Um, but one thing I, I'll say is, with the support of my family, you know, that I had behind me, you know, my mum and my dad having good figures there for me, um, you know, I got into to debt pretty early, purchasing property and stuff like that. So always had that holding me to not like really be a larrikin, um, but always had responsibility, but I did go off the rails. Like one thing that never lost me was I, I, I worked hard with whatever I did, um, but it took me a little while to find my niche um, because ultimately I had to learn to walk again uh, for, t for you know, a good six to 12 months. And then I could intertwine with the boys. So yeah. then I was like, mm. well, I didn't go out clubbing. I didn't do this, that. So I ended up being able to do that. Yeah. So, you know, I obviously was reliving a bit of that. But lucky I was young, like, and I did that then. And, um, you know, then I went through my period where all boys probably go through, I'd say, where, you know, they need that time to kind of um, have where they they either go down the wrong path or they go down the right path. And um, with my parents, you know, backing and my family and having good, you know, morals and values um, that they preach, I ended up going down the right path. Um, and, you know, I got married young in the end um, and I had kids young. Um, but definitely, man, like it, it, it was a good six to ten months where I was like, geez, I could have, if I think back, I yeah. could have 
been going down there. 100%. And then I would have been 27 thinking, geez, what am I doing? Like, um, and, you know, I, I grew up very young. I grew up quick when I was yeah, young. Was, yeah. um, and do I regret it? No, I don't um, because now I can see other people, um, mates and this and that, going through the, what I went through maybe three, four, five years ago. And now I'm like, okay, I've been there. I've done that. Now I've got other challenges in life. Um, and that's where I try and help me mates. Like, sure. you know, if they ask and they want it to say, okay, like, why don't you think of this? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? To try and be like a mentor because I lived life young. I, I lived, I lived life in the fast lane. Um, yeah. but now nah, I had a dog attitude, man. I just kept like whatever come in front of me, I just ran through it. And that's one thing that I'm lucky I had because sometimes like people, if they had to retire, they'd be like, they're just going to sit here and say, why me? Well, the world's over basically. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and then five yeah. years are going to go by and guess what? Yeah. Like in AFL world, I would have been nine, ten years in now. Yeah. Like if I kept thinking that, man, imagine nine, ten years I've been thinking that. Yeah. Oh, man, I'd be nowhere. Hmm. Um, I just kept moving forward. Um, so – I'm grateful for that, grateful for people around me to, to give me that and, and help me. Um, but, yeah, like it is a, it is a Ooh, challenge, yeah, man. Sure, man. It is a challenge. 100%. So obviously football being your whole world yeah. and then that just being ripped away from you. Obviously, you know, you've, you've explained how hard that yeah. was. But did you have – what happened next? Like did you have a plan? Did you even think about a plan B, you know? Mm. How did – your nah, business come about and I didn't have a plan to be honest. Um, I just said I got into debt. Obviously, I purchased property pretty young, at eighteen or whatever it was. Um, I had responsibilities. Um, I could have gone and blown money, but lucky again, my dad, you know, said, "Do you want to do this or do you want to do that?" And I decided to go down that path. Then I just said, "Okay, well." I've got to start from the start. Obviously, there was a period where I had a contract, um, so I was still getting paid, obviously, mm. but I was retired. And West Coast were fantastic with that. They were amazing. They were they they looked after me um, amazingly. So I said, oh, all right, well, I worked it out. I worked out the figures, and I said, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to I'm going to um, do something that's going to earn me money, and that like I can kind of do my own thing in the future. And hopefully have a spin on it. Now, my my dad was a sparky originally and always said I hated trades. <laughs> like I'm never being a tradie. Somehow I ended up doing electrical. So I was getting obviously what I like my contract and I didn't care with the electrical, the apprenticeship. I just wanted to learn, 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 learn. Mm -hmm. The business side, the technical side, the everything. At that stage, you don't think running your own business. But I said as I grew and I went through, I wanted to master it, master it, master it. And then, mate, I got to a point where I got towards the end and I sit my, I sat my um, my uh, contractor's license pretty early and um, I just went in the deep end, mate, and went into business very young. Um, and it was around COVID um, and it was tough. Like I was kind of like a deer in the headlights. Um, a lot of things were changing and I didn't understand it. Took me a little bit to find my feet, um, but um, I had a lot of experience in different areas, not just in the field, but just even dealing with people and, and relationships. There was a period of time where, you know, um, I was off feet for a while. So, you know, I got to deal with builders, clients and this and that as an apprentice, but then, you know, as an as an A grade and stuff like that, I started to take on a bit more of a, of, of a role. And that's why I said, you know what? I want to take my attitude that I had with football mm. and see what I can do in a business sense. Um, and the way I want to do it is, you know, I want to try and bring in the new school way where like I saw that there was a gap in the industry where, you know, some people, you know, you promise, you, you over promise and under deliver. Whereas I said, well, you know what? My work ethics, a big part of what I do what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get one client and I'm just going to I'm just going to make sure that they are well looked after and then you know hopefully the word spreads and yeah. this and that. And that's how I started off mate. Like I just started off kind of just seeing what happened 
Um, I, I injected a bit of money into the business to start so I didn't have to worry about finances and this and that and, you know, getting this, turning over this and this and that. Like, I didn't want that stress. Mm -hmm. I just said, I'm going to start small and see what happens. Eventually, you network and you go through things and this and that and, um, you know, it's grown. It's grown. It's grown naturally um, and how it's grown is from the team that I surrounded myself with. Like, um, my guys and, and my team and, and I'm a big believer about brand, like your brand has to be quality. You don't, as just as good as you get a good name, you can lose that name, sure. mate, 10 times as quick. Yep, so I preach that into my guys. I, as much as there's, you know, probably a few that scatter everywhere and probably, you know, interstate, you know, interstate and this and that. One thing I preach is the brand. Don't, like, this is what I want, this is what I expect, and I treat them like family. When it's time for business, it's business. When it's time, if they have a, a personal issue or this or that, they can call me. They don't have to go through five different people to come to me. They can call me direct. And, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a detriment to my family. You know, my wife and my kids, obviously, you know, they, they maybe don't get the best of me because, like, sometimes I am – inundated with a phone call or I'm trying to help people with this or that, but that's my nature. And at the end of the day, you know, um, I'm trying to set up the building blocks so, you know, I can just kind of, um, fine tune things for when I'm comfortable of, of that happening and someone, you know, taking a bit more of a, a leadership role and stuff mm -hmm. like that and doing this and that. But one thing I always said is you always keep your finger on the pulse because as soon as you kind of get take your foot off the pulse and finger off the pulse, slowly, slowly, yeah. man, you start to lose that tangibility. Um, like I, I know where all the boys are today. I know what they're doing, what the queries are, what the concerns are. Yeah, they go through another port, like if it's on-site issue or this or that, but I know exactly where they are, what's happening, this and that. And that's, for me, that's not being controlling. That's just taking care of your business. And the boys sure. respect that. Sure. Um, and they get the results for me at the end of the day. Like, I can only do so much. Without the cattle, you can't you can't do the work. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it has its challenges. But um, I guess we'll, we'll see where we kind of go. Um, and, you know, I just want work to be a fun place where people can be comfortable and they can speak their mind and also – like they have that fine line between, you know, personal life and work. Uh, um, don't take me for a ride, but also, you know, enjoy yourself as well. Like work, you have to work because you have to live, but I don't want it to take over your life. Um, I'm a big preacher of that. Um, so, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, um, Cab Vault, that's just, you know, that's the brand and, and that's what it is and, um, yeah, like I didn't expect it to kind of traject how it did, but it's a lot of hard work and like I'm not settled yet. Like I still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. to kind of um, hopefully, you know, make it consistent and make it to that level where I'm I'm, I'm content and I'm happy. Um, what is that level? What's that? <laughs> like what's, what's the goal? The goal is, the goal is, is just to, uh, to be honest, you know what? <sighs> There is a goal in mind, like obviously for what it is, but I just obviously with the industry, the industry is a bit, everyone's obviously a bit, interest rates are high, things are happening, there's a lot of moving parts. The building and construction game, you see, like there's a lot of statistics out there where, you know, um, builders, contractors, everyone, you know, are in a very, very vulnerable um, space and field. Um, my biggest thing is just, um, like just being consistent. Like I just want to make sure that the guys or girls, whoever's a part of the business, when they come to work, they're happy. Like I want people that are here for a number of years, not just turnover, like mm -hmm. oh, come in, come out, come in, come out. Because to train and invest and, and put time into guys and girls and this and that, it's, it's, it's hard, man. Like that's time you don't get back. You don't get back that time. And then for people to come in and out, um, it affects your business and your flow. And also your clients start saying, geez, what's going on here? Why has he lost 
10 guys or why has he lost this or why has he done that? And people start talking. So for me, like, you know, the building blocks are there, don't get me wrong, but it's like, okay, where can we really get this to? Um, you know, um, where can we get it to where, you know, I can get it to a point where, as I said, I'm fine tuning and people are, you know, taking charge and responsibility and are comfortable and they've got the systems in place where they can they can look after things where it's not, you know, like me call, like calling the shots mm-hmm. or whatever it is. I want to be able to give that opportunity to people to help me on that journey as in, in a management um, like hemisphere to – to help me drive it. Yeah. At the moment, the guys and that, like, they, you know, they do the work and stuff like that, but, like, my vision is only kind of, like, in my brain um, because at the moment, you know, like, you know, I'll share it with my team and, you know, admin and, and the guys out in the field, but ultimately, you know, you know, you have to drive that. So I just want it to be consistent and a happy workplace. I'm not here to take on the world. I don't operate like that. I just want to do a good job, have a good brand and deliver a good product. Um, Whether that's big, small, medium, I don't care. Um, I just just want people to enjoy like, you know, good relationships and good work. That's that's all. That's that's my goal. Um, Some people, it's not about making money and ridiculous money and this and that. When you start looking at the color of the note that you're getting, you start looking, you, you, your business starts actually getting affected because when you look at that, you're actually losing part of like what you, how you well, started. Yeah, yeah, definitely, like definitely. I remember you always look at, oh, when's your next phone call coming? Like whereas sometimes you're like, when's the phone stopping? Mm. And when they, you're in those moments, I always think back to it. Like don't forget when you were actually trying to push and, you know, you get your business that. out. You <laughs> wanted that. Yeah, exactly. Like, so enjoy it. Embrace it. Like, I love it, man. Like, I love talking to people on the phone. Like, my phone goes ballistic. I love it. And <laughs> nine times out of ten, we don't even talk about work. We talk about life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, build and a personal that's what it's like, mate. Mm. Like, I don't, the last thing I want to worry about, yeah, work is one thing, but, mate, I want to have fun. Like, cool, this is man. something that Definitely. I do – 24 7 mm. like it's not always about business Definitely. business is a small part but it's the relationships you make if you make strong relationships and you make them tangible the business takes care of itself That's like it. it does mate like right. at the end of the day i don't care how big small whatever you are but if you make good relationships and you deliver the business and everything takes care of itself mm. um it's proven yeah. um and that's what I enjoy. Like I enjoy people talking, you know, about their holidays or this or that that they do, you know, this time of the year because like you look at it and you say, oh, like at least they're comfortable to talk to you about that yeah. and this and that. It's not just like, hey, mate, can you do this or do that, do that. Sometimes, yeah, it's like that. But um, you talk, you have a laugh, you get to know people, you get to know, say, you know, what's going on in their world, what challenges, say, other bil- like builders or clients or other contractors even are having, like I don't just keep it to my clients. I, I speak to other contractors because I'd rather them, I'd rather, you know, get to know people around me because sometimes, you know, you might be a sparky and you're going through the same same issues through a business that I'm going through. And, and for me to, you know, say a couple things to you, maybe you've been through that experience and you can say, oh, look, I did this or did that. Mm-hmm. So you try and align yourself with people that, with good values and other businesses and that's how you learn and grow. Um, so I think people just get caught up in this, nah, like it's dog eat dog. But it shouldn't be like that. Like it should be okay. Like there's enough there's enough pie for everyone. Definitely. There's yeah. enough slices of pie for everyone. How can I maximize what pie that I have mm. to put me in a good position, um, whether it's financially and as a business and as a workplace? How can I maximize that as best as what I possibly can rather than, you know, stomping on him or doing this or doing that or t- taking shortcuts because 
there's only one way when you do that stuff. Yep. It's it's only down. Yep. So um, you can't operate like that these days. For sure, man. Of course, ultimately, it's about being a good person too. You, know? you have to, mate. Good Definitely. good things come to the good people. You're right. That's right. And it's funny how, like, yeah. uh, you know, sports people like yourself, like us, you know, you've played at the highest level. The natural progression is always business. Yeah. What would you say, like, is the biggest thing that footy taught you that you can apply to your business or that you have applied to your business? Um, Footy, the beauty about footy, what it taught me was um, it taught, taught me to be committed to something um, and work hard and also dealing with different people. In a team sport, you deal with so many different personalities. Like there would have been hundreds of people, hundreds of teammates I've had, you know, 20 plus coaches I've had throughout it, whether it's development or not. Like it's it taught me in a business sense that you work as a you have to work as a collective to get yeah. a, a given goal. Like um, you can't just do everything yourself. And when you do, yeah, you'll last maybe one, two, three weeks, mm. but you end up burning out. Um, and the only way for you to succeed is to work hard. There's no other ingredient to success other than luck, which luck yeah. isn't even an, an ingredient. That's just luck. Do you yeah. believe in luck? Or do you make uh, your own luck? You make your own luck. Yeah. Some people are lucky, yeah. but in my life, I'll be honest, adversities, uh, <laughs> I've had a, a, a crap ton of um, uh, bloody adversities. So, like, to be honest, luck hasn't kind of come my way, I'd old think. It's always been something that I've had to push through or mm. fight through or get through this or get through that. So... Like, you know, the old saying, you might get knocked down one, two, three, four, five times, but eventually you'll get back up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and um, that's what sport and football and that taught me. It taught me good relationship skills, working towards a common goal with a collective and using people around you to succeed, to help you succeed and help them succeed. And also work ethic. Like, if you have a, t if you have a teammate that's dragging his weight, and he comes back a bit tubby after, you know, off season. <laughs> What's he got to do? He's got to shed, shed, shed the weight, and he's got to work twice as hard. Um, and that's going to put him in a in a good spot to help your team. Mm. Um, and and I guess that's that's um that's kind of what's helped me put that into the business. Um, don't get me wrong; I'm nowhere near perfect, but um, like I try to be perfect. I try to be as perfect as I can be with whatever I do. Um, and sport taught me that, um, you know, uh, I've never done really an individual sport as such, but like, I, I wouldn't know how to do an individual sport because you need your team around you. And like, you know, even tennis, for example, like these superstars playing tennis, yeah, it's an individual sport, but they have a team around them exactly. as well. So it's still the same attitudes and mentalities. doesn't matter what you do. You can do sport, you can do business, you can you know, even if it's packing shelves or doing this or that, like everything relates. Yeah. It, it, it's not like, oh, no, he's, he's doing something secret or, or whatever it is. There's no secret. All it is is it just comes down to, you know, um, working hard and, and, and um, making the most of the opportunities. Like that's all it is. And when you do a job, do it good. That's like it, sure. you, you can tie your shoelace <laughs> – you can tie your shoelace one way where, you know, it comes undone in two <laughs> minutes or you can tie it properly where exactly. it's not going to come undone when you go for a run. Yeah, like, right. just do it properly, mate. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, exactly right. I, totally agree. I just wanted to finish up because I think you'd be a perfect person to give advice. What would you give – what advice would you give to sort of young players that now you've gone through all these, yeah. like, you know, ups and downs when you were, like, 17, 18? What, what would you tell your younger self, let's say? Um – Tell me younger self, I'll probably say enjoy enjoy the moments as you go through life. Like um, take each opportunity that you have and give it a red hot crack because at the end of the day, um, you, you might think it seems like a lifetime but it's not a lifetime. When you're in that moment, like go hard with it. Like whether it's playing football, playing soccer, playing lawn bowls, whatever it is, cricket, like give it your 110% detail and, and attention to detail because 
you never know what could happen. Like you never know what could happen. And surround yourself with good people because when you do that, sometimes things can just happen. Do you know what I mean? Um, and the biggest ingredient for success is like uh, by no means I'm, I'm not successful. I'm trying to push to that. But like the biggest ingredient for it is just work ethic, mate. And like stay in your lane and and – what, run your own race. Like if if you start worrying about those around you, that's when you get sidetracked. Like, and that's where social media is a big thing. Definitely. Like, if someone's doing fantastic, pat them on the back, and maybe maybe tap into their brain and their knowledge yeah, yeah, because they can give it to yourself. Don't get envious or jealous or exactly. think you need to be there and give yourself timelines. Like, run your own race and set yourself up properly. Like. Work hard, tick off each goal as they come. Um, it's that's probably the biggest thing. Um, when you're young, you're keen, this and that. You just want to go a bullet a gate. Um, and I did that. And sometimes you fall. Um, whereas if you think about it, you put a goal in place, you hit that goal, you go to the next one, you support people around you. Eventually, things do turn. Um, but just be happy with what you do, mate. Like, um, not everyone has to be. You know, no, not everyone has to be successful on this and that. What people deem success is different. You yeah, deem it exactly right, different. I will, you will, anyone will. Um, you know, um, we're fortunate. We live in a good country. We got good opportunities. So, um, everyone has their own way of living. But um, yeah, that, that's the main thing. Like, can't really add it, add no, much look, more to man, it. You've you've covered all bases here. And look, it's been an honour to have you on. Yeah. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Amazing chat, honestly, but like you the way you've changed, you know, I know myself, man, just going through something like that. If I was to go through something like that, it'd be a big challenge, man. Yeah. Like I'd feel like my world the world's over, man. Yeah. You've made like your dream move and then all of a sudden bang. So for me, man, it's honestly it's a testament to your character and mentality. And I wish you all the best with your family, your business. And yeah, it's been an amazing chat, man. I uh, appreciate it. And it's good to um meet again it's you're mm. doing good things oh, and thank you, man. as thank i you. said man i don't do social media so when i saw it i saw i'm like matt i know man it's been <laughs> a while that, i'm like that's crazy man so yeah. no nah, good on you and oh, keep thanks, doing good man. things thank you and um thanks for having me on Anything. no worries thank you once again a absolute pleasure incredible story if you haven't give uh Cavalt a follow on that uh, are you on instagram <laughs> i do i'm not i'm not a on their flat out, but the I business do. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give them a follow. We'll tag yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Make sure you give them a follow. Thank you once again for joining us uh, on another episode of the Almost Made It podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you're following us on Spotify, subscribing to YouTube, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, TikTok, all, all the rest of the, you know, you know, the, you know, the spiel. Yeah, you know, every week, <laughs> every week, <laughs> the same thing. So, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you next episode. <laughs>